Across many scientific studies, we have established that somewhere between 15 and 40% of the dog population experience noise sensitivity. Most of those report sensitivity to big loud bangs like fireworks. And if you're watching this video and your dog really only gets reactive to those big loud bangs, like fireworks, like big construction, then probably this video is not gonna be right for you. Probably you're gonna wanna check out this one. That's gonna be more suitable. However, if your dog is experiencing high noise phobia and his sensitivity to noises is occurring multiple times a day, even to things perhaps that you can't even hear, or maybe you can hear them, but they're really quiet comparatively. If that's the case, if your dog is experiencing a noise phobia, then in this video, I'm gonna be breaking down your next steps, how you can help treat your dog's noise phobia, and how we can help getting your sanity back. So if you're interested in learning how, keep watching. What's up guys, it's Jenna with Dog Liaison where I coach you on how to enhance your dog's mental health. I'm a professional dog trainer and in my signature program, the Recovering Rover Program for Dog Anxiety, I work with dogs facing multiple anxiety related disorders. And most of the dogs in the RP are dealing with some sort of noise phobia. In fact, it's very common in our coaching calls and in our curriculum lessons for our clients to have their earbuds in and have their volumes turned really down because their dogs can't handle the sounds that a computer emits. They can't handle the little noises of talking. And even when their guardian does speak out loud, the dog gets reactive and starts barking. This is the life of living with a dog with noise phobia. It's very frustrating because you hear that barking, you hear that sensitivity multiple times a day. Now, what do you do in that case? Well, the very first thing you need to do if your dog is experiencing frequent noise phobia is you need to go to the vet. First and foremost, rule out any health concerns. You know you hear me say that a gazillion times on this channel, <laughs> but we really do need to rule out any health concerns. But secondly, we need to acknowledge that when we're dealing with noise phobia, training is actually way harder than anything else, than training, say, her reactivity to dogs, than training her reactivity to squirrels, than training her separation anxiety. Because the sound sounds often occur even without your awareness, even without your control. And most importantly, they're happening so frequently that you could use all the management in the world, which we're gonna talk about in a second, but you could use all the management in the world and there's still be noise. So this is something that behavior medication is super beneficial with. And the reason is, is because it can start to push their threshold further back. Sounds that would initially make them go over threshold won't if they're on a proper anxiety medication. Now, to be very clear, anxiety medication is meant to be used combined with a training protocol, which we're getting into in a second, okay? It's meant to be used with a training protocol. But I really recommend that in addition to that, you watch these two videos on anxiety medications to get a full appreciation on what the different medications are, why they may be necessary and how they can help you and your dog. To be clear, I really want to emphasize that anxiety medication should not have a stigma. It should not be concerned. If your dog is really going over threshold five, 10, 15, 40 times in a day over little sounds, that is not a healthy life. That is not an enriched life. And your training ability is just not ever going to be able to minimize the amount of trauma that your dog is going through. It's not fair to have your dog go over threshold that often. In order to mitigate that, anxiety medication is sometimes helpful. Now, I also wanna point out that noise phobia is very often correlated with separation related problems. This is something that the research examines a lot, that these two anxiety disorders often go hand in hand. So it's very important that if your dog is also facing separation anxiety, that you are working to mitigate that as well because these two anxiety disorders can affect one another. If your dog goes over threshold because she heard a certain sound this morning and then a half hour later you have to leave her alone, that's two traumatic events occurring back to back. That is a lot of stress for your dog's body to go through. The recovery out of that is at least 24 hours, if not all the way up to 72 hours for the body to hit homeostasis again. This is very important that you are mindful of the amount of trauma that your dog is actually experiencing and that you are making sure that her recovery time is fair if she is going through that trauma. Now, let's talk about the actual training protocol. For your training protocol, you're gonna to wanna to start off by finding your dog's threshold. And what this means is that you're actually finding exactly what sounds are going to actually get your dog response. So what you're really looking for are the ears perked up. You're really looking for the dog to like 
hear and identify the sound, but not start actually becoming excessively fearful or excessively reactive. Now, what that excessive reaction looks like is gonna be different for every dog, of course. Some dogs are excessively reactive just by being silent and crawling in the corner and shutting down. And then other dogs are gonna get up and bark, 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 bark. So everything is relative to your individual dog. But you're looking for some sort of response that identifies your dog has heard the sound, but isn't necessarily getting her to that max point that you're so familiar with. I don't recommend men just like arbitrarily just like starting making a bunch of ruckus in your house that's not a really a good plan you want to start off with the quietest thing you can think of maybe it's just as simple as you like tapping your pencil on a desk maybe it's just as simple as you coughing you really want to establish what sounds are going to get that response now if there's a sound you already know is going to make your dog bark 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 do not make that sound the goal is not to make sounds that you know are going to make your dog bark. The goal is to find the sound that you don't know. The goal is to find the point that you aren't aware of. That's what you're trying to do in these experiments. I do recommend keeping a log, making sure you have your data. Then once you know exactly what sounds are making your dog get that response, now it's actually time for the training. To be clear, you want to be very intentional about what sounds you're working on at a time. So let's talk about this. It doesn't make sense to try to desensitize all noises all the time from now on that would be completely unrealistic. And the reason is, is because if you have a dog that is highly noise phobic, he's probably going to react to a lot of sounds and you're just literally or feasibly can't control all of them. So you wanna be mindful about the ones that you can control. You wanna be selective about the ones that you are going to be focusing on and the ones that you are not, you're going to be implementing management. So for example, you may decide that you wanna start working on the ice machine. You wanna start working on every, you know, every day at two o'clock, your fridge makes the ice. Okay, that's a very controllable sound. You know when it's going to occur, you know what sound it's going to create, you know where you can be, right? That's a very controllable sound. On the other hand, the kids playing outside in the front yard may not be as controllable, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but it may not be as controllable because sometimes they're gonna be screaming, sometimes they're just gonna be running around, sometimes they're not there the whole time. So there's more variables that you can't necessarily focus on. It makes sense to start off with the ones that are within your control. And then when the kids are outside, you just make sure that the windows are closed and you know there's some sort of sound machine on. Let's talk about management. Management can be anything from, like I said, turning on a white noise machine, turning on a TV if your dog isn't reacted to the TV, closing all of the windows. It could be as simple as making sure that you're in a closet with your dog at a certain time of day and giving her just lovings, right? And making sure that you're in a really quiet spot. If I had a client who every day at 2.30, the kids would get out of the school next to her house and she didn't have kids, but the school would let out and every day at 2.30, there would be a bunch of noise and it would be a ruckus. And so every day at 2.30, she crawled into her walk-in closet and read a book for 30 minutes. Is it weird? Yeah. Does it suck? Yeah. But does it prevent your dog from experiencing trauma? 100%. And that absolutely gives you space and ability to build up to that point. That's not your long-term plan. I'm not saying do that for the next 14 years, guys. I'm saying do that while you're working on some of these other sounds that are less noisy and more controllable. And then you can work your way up to crawling out of the closet <laughs> and working at that 2.30 time of day, right? Just make that a goal. Just make that something that you're working towards as opposed to trying to tackle every little thing. Appreciate that when you're working through and desensitizing these sounds, it's still challenging. Even if your dog isn't barking, it's still requiring a lot of effort from your dog. And so you don't wanna try to tack on the effort throughout the day. You wanna make sure that you're very aware of how much effort, how much stress you're putting your dog under to make sure it's a fair amount of stress and you're not just continue and increase the challenge. Now let's talk about the actual training protocol that you're gonna do. There's kind of like a three or four step phase, okay? For the purpose of this video, we're gonna run with the analogy that the noise that you're desensitizing is the ice maker machine in your kitchen. And you know that this happens every day at two o'clock and it goes for about 25 seconds. Okay, what you're gonna do for 25 seconds is you're just gonna yes and feed and you're gonna pair the treat, the high value treat 
with the time of the ice machine, okay? At first, it's just gonna be like one right after the other, rainbow, 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 you're feeding, 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 and it's great. As you increase the difficulty, you're gonna start to hold back those treats a little bit to see if your dog is gonna look at you or engage with you instead of running to the ice maker machine. You're gonna see, are they willing to turn their back on that and kind of disengage a bit? If they are, then you can feed that. At some point, you're gonna transition into a more long-lasting event, a high-value event. So this could be a Kong full of peanut butter. This could be the time that you pull out their favorite toy and you run around the house like crazy people. Some sort of very reinforcing event that gets timed with every time the ice maker machine goes off. Then the ice maker machine now has a positive association. It now means something good is about to occur, right? That's step one and two. Step three is to now desensitize that and give it a more organic behavior. So for example, if your goal is to make sure that every single time the noise machine goes off, your dog just continues laying on the couch next to you, or if you're at the computer, you wanna make sure your dog stays wherever they are in the house and just stays comfortable, you're gonna start to reinforce those moments. You're gonna start to set them up and it looks organic to your dog. Your dog thinks, oh, mom's just at the computer working, but you know this is still a training session. I still have my awareness. I still have my treats. I'm ready to intervene. And then if Rover continues to stay off in the corner, then you'll continue to feed that behavior. The important part is, is that yes, in these situations, you are setting them up to look organic. Yes, you are setting them up to look realistic as much as possible, but you know they're not. You know that you're very aware of what's going on. You know the criteria of the sound. You know the amount of stress that your dog is under in the situation. You know how challenging it is. You know how successful they have been in the past or not successful. So you're very aware. It's just that your dog thinks, oh, this is just another moment in time. This is true regardless of what situation you're setting up. So for example, if your goal is to desensitize the sounds of the neighbor kids playing outside, you know that it's just two o'clock and you're waiting for that time for those kids to go outside and make noise and then you can intervene. But what your dog sees is you just sitting on the couch watching TV acting like nothing's going on. It doesn't feel like a training session, it feels like a normal moment. Now, one of the ways that you increase criteria is by removing management. So for one of the things I see a lot on tutorials is just like, as soon as you go and decide that you're gonna work on a specific sound, I want you to remove all of the management, I want you to get rid of all of the white noise, I want you to open up all the doors, all the blinds. I want you to just unleash the sound and let it operate at full capacity and then try to train that. I don't recommend that for the vast majority of the dogs, particularly their dogs with noise phobia. In fact, what you want to do is you want to remove the management very methodically and you want to make sure that removing the management counts as a way of increasing the criteria. So let's run this hypothetical. Let's say that you are focusing on the neighbor kids playing outside and typically during the situation you have three layers of management, which are that you have have the window closed, you have the white noise machine on, and you're close to your dog. Now your end goal is to have the window open, have the white noise machine off, and to be able to be all the way at your desk, right? That's your end goal. But you can't just necessarily like flip a switch and remove all of those management. Instead, what you would wanna do is you wanna select one of those management to remove. I would recommend removing the white noise machine. So you're still keeping the window closed and you're still staying close to your dog, but you've removed one of the white noise machine, so you've removed a management which increases the criteria. Then once your dog can handle that situation, Situation. they are sitting on the couch eating their Kong and Rover's happy with that, then you remove the next layer of management and you decide to open the window. That increases the difficulty even more. Now you see Rover is chewing on her Kong and everything's going well with that. So you decide, okay, I'm gonna remove the third layer of management, which is that I'm gonna build distance from you, right? So you're removing the management methodically and you're doing it with awareness that that is increasing difficulty. So not only are you increasing the difficulty in the sense of like you're removing treats and instead giving them an activity that's going to desensitize the sound, but you're also increasing the difficulty by removing the management. Something that I really need you to appreciate is that there isn't necessarily a cure to noise phobia. Noise sensitivity, if your dog is just hypersensitive to noise to an extent, that's always going to be true. But what our goal is when we're actually training, what our goal is, is to make sure that sounds, especially commonplace sounds, are not anxiety inducing, that they are not necessarily causing our dog chronic stress, right? I don't think it's fair to assume that you can do all of the training in the world and then one day your dog is just gonna love all 
all sounds and always feel safe regardless of what's going on. Especially for these highly anxious dogs, especially if they have like separation anxiety and they're noise phobic. If they have all of those things, that would still really like tall order. I'm not saying it's impossible. It's just the likelihood is not there, right? So instead, what I want you to think about is I'm prioritizing commonplace sounds, things that my dog is going to encounter frequently in her life. And those are the things that I'm choosing to desensitize while recognizing that there are other things in her life that I'm always going to have to implement management because her ears are sensitive, because she hears at a very high capacity, because she identifies as noise and those scare her. So we're appreciating that our goal is not to make everything desensitized. Our goal is just to make sure that certain things, commonplace things are desensitized. Now, if you're looking for a full tutorial on resolving dog reactivity, I recommend checking out these two videos. Yes, in those videos, I talk about visible triggers. However, the principles taught in those videos are equally applicable to noise phobias. So if you're interested in checking those out, I recommend it. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit like, consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell so you get notified when I drop a new video and I'll see you guys next week.